Chapter Thirteen of And Then the Town Took Off by Richard Wilson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Thirteen. As Superior headed back across the Atlantic, the Earth people were given a farewell tour. For the first time they had an authorized look at the underground domain of the Gizzles, which they reached through the tunnel that led below from under Cavalier's grandstand. The observation room which Don and Jen Jervis had found was connected by a hidden elevator to a vast main chamber. A control console formed the entire wall of one end of it. Half a dozen Gizzles stood at the base of the console. From time to time one of them would launch himself upward with his powerful legs, grab a protruding rung, make an adjustment, then drop lightly back to the floor. Don and Alice stood for a moment watching Professor Garrett, who was tugging at his beard as he became aware of the magnitude of the operation which drove Superior through the skies and was soon to take it across space to the asteroid belt. "'Poor father,' Alice whispered to Don. "'Magnology in action after all these years, and he didn't have a thing to do with it. Is that why he wants to go with the master? I imagine so. If he stayed on earth, he'd have nothing. He's too old to start again. It's kind of them to take him and mother. In a way, I suppose, his going is justification for his years of work. He'll at least be close to the things he might have developed in the right circumstances. He certainly won't be lonely, Don said. Have you noticed the rush to emigrate? Cheeky McPherson's decided to stick with his bubblegum factory. He says the gizzles are a ready-made market. He saw one of them cram five superbubs into his mouth at one time. That's twenty-five cents right there. Alice giggled. And half the student body of Cavalier wants to go. You'd think they'd be disillusioned with father, but they're not. I guess they had to be crazy to enroll in the first place. Senator Thebold's started campaigning to be named U.S. Ambassador to Superior. I heard him talking to the man from the New York Times. I suspect they'll give it to him. They'll need his influence to get Senate approval of the treaty with the Gizzles. I had a little talk with Jen Jervis, Alice said. She's radiant, have you noticed? The Senator finally asked her to marry him. That's all that was the matter with her. Bobby the Bold had left her hanging by her thumbs too long. I guess he did. Don sought a way to get the conversation away from Jen Jervis. Where's Doc Bendy? He certainly turned out to be a disappointment. Poor Doc, Alice said. He's always the first to form a committee. But then his enthusiasm wears off, and he goes back to the bottle. Only now he's got a keg. Don snapped his fingers. The keg? I almost forgot about that matter duplicator. If it can give you perfume and Doc rum... Come on, let's reopen negotiations with the master. They found the old man surrounded by a group of reporters being charmingly evasive with the science editor of Time. Professor Garrett had now joined this group where he listened as eagerly as a student. The master was showing the vault-like chamber in which he had spent the generations since the spaceships left Gorel Z. He let them examine the coffin-sized drawer that had been his bed, and indicated the others where the younger ones still slept, awaiting the birth of their new planet. Don counted fewer than three dozen drawers. Is that all? he asked. Infants and children take up less room, the master said. There are two or three in each drawer, and still others in the ships that never come to work. Even so, we number fewer than a thousand. But you have the matter duplicator, Don said. Won't it work on people? Unfortunately, no. Transubstantiation has never worked on living cells. Don't think we haven't tried. We shall have to encourage early marriages and hope for a high birth rate. Now about this transubstantiator, the time man said, and Garrett's head cocked in delight, apparently at the resounding sound of the word. What's the principle? You don't have to give away the secret. Just give me the general idea. The master shook his head. Don asked, what will you trade for the transubstantiator and the paralysis scepter you gave Hector? The old man smiled. Not even New York, he said. Our moral code couldn't permit us to trade either. Earth has enough problems already. Offer him the formula for fusion, Frank Fogarty's voice said from the Pentagon. The old man shuddered. 
I heard that, he said. No, thank you, Mr. Secretary. This is the clean bomb, Fogarty said. It ought to come in very handy in construction work on your new planet. We will try to manage in our own way, the master said. He asked Garrett, Wouldn't you say that magnology was sufficient for our purposes, Professor? Alice's father beamed at being consulted and hearing his own term applied to the Gorel Z propulsion system. More than sufficient, he said enthusiastically. Preferable, in fact. Magnology is safe, stressless, and permanently powerful in stasis. It is the ultimate in gravity beam nullification. If anything can glue the asteroids back into the planet they once were, magnology will do it. You can understand how I was misled. Your system so fitted my theory that I imagined it was I who had caused Superior to rise from the earth. I understand perfectly, the master replied graciously, and I cannot say how glad I am that you and Mrs. Garrett have chosen to stay with Cavalier and Superior and become citizens of our new world. What will you call your new planet? the AP man asked. Asteroida? Something like that? We haven't decided. I welcome suggestions. The UPI man was inspired. How about New World? he asked. That describes it perfectly, doesn't it? New World. New World? He wrote it on a piece of paper and admired it. Thank you, the master said. We'll certainly consider it. The UPI man was satisfied. He had a lead for his story. Superior, November 6, Associated Press. The floating city of Superior, earthbound again after nearly six days of aerial meandering, prepared today to discharge its former residents. Its new inhabitants, the kangaroo-like gizzles who came from beyond the stars to swing an unprecedented barter deal involving the United States, Russia, and Germany, said they would leave almost immediately to join Superior with the new planet they had been building in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Heidelberg, November 6, Associated Press This university city said goodbye today to some four hundred interplanetary visitors it belatedly realized had long been burrowed under it. The first officially acknowledged flying saucer landed on Heidelberg's outskirts early today and took aboard the Gizzles, who, but for the shrewd maneuvering of the U.S. Secretary of State, Foghorn Frank Fogarty, acting through a hastily commissioned ex-Sergeant Troubleshooter, General Don Cord. Moscow, November 6, Reuters. The industrial city of Magnitogorsk was assured of remaining Soviet territory today with the departure of one thousand kangaroo-like aliens. These visitors from Gorel Z, the doomed world whose survivors will increase the number of planets in the solar system to ten with the creation between Mars and Jupiter of... From the editorial page of the New York Daily News, Nice knowing you, Gizzles, but... Next time you visit us, how about doing it openly instead of burrowing underground like a bunch of reds? Bulletin. Aboard the Spaceship Superior, November 6th, United Press International. This former Ohio town, adapted for space travel, took off for the asteroid belt today after transferring 2,878 of its citizens to a convoy of buses bound for a relocation center. The other 122 of its previous population of 3,000 chose to remain aboard to pioneer the birth of the tenth planet of the solar system, New World. New World, named by the United Press International Correspondent accompanying the survivors of the burned-out planet of Gorel Z, will become the second known inhabited planet in the solar system. Just a minute, Alice, Don said. No, sir, Sergeant General Donald Court, sir, not a minute longer. You tell him now. All right, sir. Don Court, General Temporary, said to Frank Fogarty, Secretary of Defense, has the mission been accomplished? Don and Alice were in the back seat of an Army staff car that was leading the bus convoy. Looks that way, son. Our best telescopes can't see them any more. I'd say New World was well on its way to a morning. Alice Garrett, her arms around Don and her head on his shoulder, spoke directly into the transceiver. Mr. Fogarty, are you aware that I haven't had a single minute alone with this human radio station since I've known him? This is the most inhibited man in the entire U.S. Army. Miss Garrett, 
the defense secretary said. I understand perfectly. When I was courting Mrs. Fogarty, I was a pilot on the Misak line. Well, never mind that. Mission accomplished, General Court, my boy. Then, sir, Don said, Sergeant Court respectfully requests permission to disconnect this blasted invasion of privacy so he can ask Miss Alice Garrett if she thinks two of us could live on a non-com's pay. The driver of the staff car, a sergeant himself, said over his shoulder, "'Can't be done, General.' Fogarty said, "'Don't be too anxious to revert to the ranks, my boy. I'll admit the T.O. for generals isn't wide open, but I'm sure we can compromise somewhere between three stripes and four stars. Suppose you take a ten-day delayed en route to Washington while we see what we can do. I'll meet you in the White House on November 16th. The President tells me he wants to pin a medal on you.' Yes, sir, Don said. Alice was very close, and he was only half listening. Any further orders, sir? Just one, Don. Kiss her for me, too. Over to you. Yes, sir, Don said. Over and out. This is the end of And Then the Town Took Off by Richard Wilson. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks.com.